Oh Man is an evaluation of modern masculinity. Join us, Rob and Jack, as we try and make sense of manhood in the 21st century. Traditional views of what makes a man are changing. In this podcast, we explore a range of topics to find out how and why. We recognize that men don't necessarily face the biggest challenges in society. In many cases, they are the problem. But by starting sensitive conversations, which men famously love, we can start to think differently about masculinity. Jack, have you ever even lifted a weight in your pathetic life? Um, yes, I have lifted a weight in my pathetic life. <laughs> I mean, I, I, do, I do it fairly regularly. It's, it's, it's nothing serious or intense like I imagine most gym goers would do. But it's my own routine. You know, I like to keep myself relatively healthy, trying to be as strong as I can be within is, the limited time window I have. Is this at home? It is at home. Yeah, I have my yeah. set of weights. My, actually, funnily enough, my, uh, my in-laws bought me some weights just before um the christmas before covid kicked off so it, it was pretty useful was... Actually, in that regard because i mean i was i was a member of the gym at the time but i thought i'll have my own weights just so i can do that in a my you know so i don't have to go to the gym like all the time but yeah no, that, that proved to be pretty useful to be honest so I I say, that was very well timed because like weights and kettlebells and stuff those were the things that were sold out pretty quickly during during covid wasn't it so yeah, so that I, I do it. I'm, I'm not a member of the gym, um, mm. like yourself, uh, but I used to be. <laughs> but I just I just don't have the time to commit to the gym, unfortunately, anymore. Amongst my many other hobbies, like recording podcasts <laughs> with yourself. <laughs> oh dear, yeah, what a shameful hobby. What about yourself? I assume the answer will be a yes. Well, I know the answer is a yes because. I used to go to the gym sometimes with you <laughs> yeah. and I use, I use a word sometimes very loosely <laughs> <laughs> when we were at university together. I forgot about that. Yeah. You, you came with me a couple of times, didn't you? Yeah. I embarrassed you a bit I remember, <laughs> on several occasions, but I did it. You know, I, I tried my best, you know, I showed intent, I guess that's a, that's all you can ask for. Exactly. I don't, I can't remember if I was very encouraging, but, I'd like to think I was. I'll, I'll... You, you had your own routine. You and you were in your, in your, <laughs> your own zone. So That's a very I just, di- I, I, diplomatic I just, response. I left you to it, Rob. And as I tried to work out the various machines in the gym, but I never encountered before in my life until I went to university. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I've been. Yeah, I go to the gym a lot. You might, you, you might not be able to tell from looking at me, but I do. So, yeah, so I, I started. I started going to the gym when I was 17, which I just before we started recording, I I, fig, I, I say I figured out, not that it took much uh, thinking. That's I've been going to the gym for 20 years. <laughs> um, but yeah, so obviously we're talking about strength and body image. And I think you can get quite deep into why people want to exercise, and especially men, obviously, and get bigger muscles. But when I look, think back to that time, I couldn't tell you now why I started doing it. And I don't want to like, you know, color in something really nice from the age of 37. Uh, From what I remember, there was just no greater urge than just, you know, having some muscles might be nice. You know, it's just that it was, it was nothing more than that. And also like compared to some 17, 18, 19, whatever year olds now, from, from what I've seen in recent years, and, and we'll talk about that uh, coming up, I, I didn't know anything. Like I, I, I walked into a gym like absolute amateur, ignorant of everything. Obviously, there was no social media, no YouTube, so you weren't getting that. If you wanted to learn about <laughs> exercise and weightlifting, you had to read a, you had to read those massive books mm. you know like textbook style things and and I, mm. I I obviously didn't want to do that well I remember you had to rely on gym instructors to sort of oh, yeah. carry it away <laughs> however from what I remember particularly at the one at university the gym instructors seemed to be a little bit more preoccupied with the women at the gym <laughs> rather than men if yes. I said if, if, if I went up to them sweating gasping looking confused they'd probably just ignore me or just go off 
fine i just give you <laughs> give you give you a pat on the bum and say you're doing great you're doing great yeah you're doing great. yeah yeah but in those days there was so there was no i for me it, there was no idea about um splits so no muscle specific days you know monday chest day nothing like that i just went on what whatever machine tickle my fancy you know whatever weight i wanted to lift that day i would lift that weight and yeah it was very very slapdash let's say recently i went on holiday to suffolk which is a place i used to go on holiday to around about probably 25 maybe even 30 years ago with my family and it was interesting looking at all the things that don't exist anymore and the new things that do exist anymore and have just grown Mm. exponentially and the gym is just or gyms in general is just one of those things that have really grown a lot in the last probably five to ten years I'd say Mm. people are a lot more um, conscious I guess of physical appearance and body image and how they want to look and you know I'm I'm, you know that's that's I've I've you know I don't think that's a bad thing I think it's a good thing to keep fit and I think a lot of people as we're going to discuss uh, later on you know it might not be a vain narcissistic thing it might just be this is really good for my mental health mm. this is really excellent having this sort of routine stable routine in my life and to many people the gym is a really positive outlet so mm. I mean that's yeah. how I see it myself does yeah. as well yeah no same and whenever I mean I, I don't go to the gym but when I do exercise or do stuff which will help with this you know improved strength for your your body i i don't just look at it as a physical thing i look at it as a mental thing as well hmm. so absolutely yeah so as we go into this then i think it's important uh, from the start to frame this discussion about body image issues for men in the context that women have had it much worse <laughs> for far longer um yeah. but i, I we won't sort of dig too much into that either so like you know we are two straight white men approaching middle age but surprisingly approaching are we uh, in it (laughs) yes approaching we're not we're not in we're not we're not in yet we're approaching come on but yeah despite coming from that background we we actually don't like to tell women how to feel about their experiences um so yeah we're not going to dive too deeply into that but we're we're making it clear from the start you know we fully understand that situation Um, and we hopefully we will revisit that um in a later episode hopefully with someone before we delve more deeply into body image i have a question for you have you ever been happy with your physical appearance i would say overall no but obviously there's highs and lows to that i've never felt like awful I've never like wanted to you know completely overhaul my my body image but I would say I've been dissatisfied with it more more often than not and this goes back to when I was a kid teenager um outside of the home and even in it sometimes I I feel very uncomfortable being shirtless now thankfully there's very few times where I would need to be shirtless but you know, we've had the heat wave recently and the picture goes up, the shirt comes off, even if you just go into a Tesco or something. I would never, ever do that. I would just feel very uncomfortable just being topless, basically. Yeah. And at the time when I was younger, I guess I didn't, I would never tell anyone. I would just not take my shirt off. And if, if, even if I was like at a beach or something or whatever, you know, it just became a bit obvious. It, but now I feel like I can understand and explain that a bit better. Yeah, so I probably still wouldn't want to go shirtless in many places. Um, Mm. But I think that should be more normal than anything else. Um, Yeah, like if it was at a beach and obviously at a swimming pool or something like that, I would would be more comfortable now doing it than, than before. But just, yeah, just overall, I guess I would say I have always been a bit conscious about um I don't know what to say really like the the fat you know I've always been I I know handles you know I've always just been conscious you know a a bit of the old muffin tops at the side a little bit of a curve at the front you know that that has always been uh in my mind yeah I mean 
I'm largely similar, to be honest. I've no, I don't think I've ever really been happy with my own physical appearance. And similar to you, I don't really feel, I never felt comfortable being shirtless. Apart from a weird spell during a second year of university where <laughs> I just really wanted to get a tan, I think. And I was, I was probably what you'd call arrogant towards the sun. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, it's very similar to you. I just, I, I'm not one of these people who, when the heat wave happens, I just whip out my top and walk half naked down to Tesco's Express to get some milk. <laughs> Um, the only time I really don't have my shirt on is when I come out of the shower or if I'm going for a swim or going to the beach like I did last week. So I, I will avoid taking my top off as much as possible, to be honest. So you always notice fat in the mirror, don't you? A little bit of a muffin top, like you said, a little bit of love handles on the side. So you can't, yeah, I, I've never been you know, like you said, never drastically transformed myself, but at the same time, I've never been 100% content. Okay, so we're going to start with body image. So we're almost a quarter of the way through the 21st century now. Uh, what, in your opinion, makes a strong man today? I mean, this is, this is very hard to define, to be honest. Because I think being a strong man can take many different forms. You can have the traditional strong man that is, you know, very muscular, almost like an Arnold Schwarzenegger type, really. You can, or you can have people can talk about strength being like the British stiff upper lip or something like that. <laughs> you know, how that, that being really steely and strong, never being flustered, not mm. being emotional. To me, like being a strong man is really about being able to articulate and communicate how you're feeling in a positive way that encourages others mm. being able to being a good leader. So, you know, trying to bring others along with you. Yeah. Um, and, you know, being a positive influence on them, not being a negative influence, I guess it's really about being a positive role model, to be honest. And also you know, being there for people as well. So if people are going through tough times, I think being strong is someone who will be there for the other person or other people to mm. make sure they're happy, to make sure they're okay, to talk things through. Obviously, that's probably not what most people think. No, no, no. <laughs> most people will probably go back to the, the first two points, which I made about physical strength and then this steeliness and no emotion. I agree completely with all of that. And, but I think I think age would come into it as well. So mm. we're speaking from a certain point of life, obviously. But I have not had that outlook forever. This is probably like a gross simplification. But, you know, I think if you're a teenager or 20 something, you would adhere more to that sort of glossy image of strong man equals, you know, glistening muscles and hairless body, you know. That that is what you would think of as a strong man. Where's this hairless thing come from? That's because cause I used to because I used to think I used to, well you you knew you know what I was like. I had like a a few strands of teenage hair when I was eighteen, and I wanted to you know have as much hair as possible because just, I saw that as a just, sign just of to, strength. Just, and just to clarify, just to clarify, you're talking about your chest, yeah? Oh yeah, I'm talking about my chest. Sorry, <laughs> yeah, yeah, nowhere else. Yeah, chest. My chest hair. Yeah, just to clarify. Thanks for that clarification, Rob. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I basically had no chest hair. I think actually when I went to, there's probably something in a Welsh air, as soon as I went to Wales to do my master's in Cardiff, I just came back with a lot of chest hair. Yeah. And, and to I, me, that to me that's a very masculine trait to have a you know a hairy chest. Um, but clearly mm. now people just want to shave it off, don't they, for some reason. Well, oh, I know before it would, uh, you would think of, again sort of the, the Arnold image but yeah. that was from his bodybuilding days and bodybuilders obviously shave their legs their chest everything because they, they want to show all the definition mm -hmm. and I know cyclists shave their legs as well on a grander scale I would say it's it's films basically yeah we talk about those as well coming up 
you know the marvel superheroes all of these things you know they don't really have hair do they so i think that's been a big part of it recently but yeah so aside from hair <laughs> yeah what, what we've talked about so the idea of strength and body image they they clearly go hand in hand for many people we'll start with the older ideals about male body image so a bit of a history <laughs> history lesson coming up i love a so, rob history lesson it, a, everyone does yeah. so right think back to some of the like most prominent male figures from let's say the early 20th century onwards so Charlie Chaplin, we're going back there. Charlie Chaplin was one of the first global superstars. When you look at him, he's, he's short, he's slim, and he's actually quite camp, you know, and he's very b- balletic in his movements. He is absolutely not muscular, and he's not any real idea of traditional masculinity. And then you come forward a bit, you've got actors like uh, Cary Grant and James Stewart. They were very lean too I wouldn't say they were muscular but they're obviously handsome but aside from that they were quite average looking and maybe that's part of the appeal you know they were sort of every every men but good looking ones Mm -hmm. (laughs) and you come forward a bit more you've got so Paul Newman and Robert Redford were like arguably the biggest name of the 70s and again aside from being incredibly good looking (laughs) they weren't they were, again, they were that lean body type, weren't they? They weren't massively muscular. They were just very trim. Mm-hmm. But it's only really when you sort of hit the late 70s and 80s that things start to change. You, so Harrison Ford, for example, was quite well built. Uh, young Tom Cruise looked very fit in that, in that literal sense. You know, he looked like he could <laughs> sprint very fast, mm-hmm. <laughs> which he still does. The change, I just want to say, I'm, I'm going to present a little theory here i'm pretty sure this is not an original theory but i i didn't look for this theory i pieced it together but again i'm sure it's not the first time it's been said because i immediately thought of arnold schwarzenegger and then you think of arnold you think Mm. of sylvester stallone and i started to look at their um films and the years when those two come along there's a sort of changing in the timeline so let's bear with me a bit because there's a lot of jumping around it's all right rocky the first Rocky film came out in 1976, Rocky II, 1979. In both those films, Rocky is c- clearly in very good shape. But he is a boxer, you know? He is a, a heavyweight boxer. He's got a lot of muscle, but he's clearly got some fat. Now, Arnold Schwarzenegger appeared in the documentary Pumping Iron in 1977. Now, this is obviously when he's still a bodybuilder. The film covers uh, Mr. Universe and Mr. Olympia. And at that point, he, Arnold is like at the peak of his powers. He, uh, I think he had won six consecutive Olympias. And he got, he's a bit, spoiler, he's about to win his seventh. He is an absolute unit in, in that, at that point in time. And, but all of that now sets this foundation for his crossover into film. But that only really started to get going in 1982. So uh, Conan the Barbarian, and in 1984, The Terminator. So with that in mind, (laughs) here we go again, stay stay with me. Rocky III, Rocky IV, and Rocky V, that's 1982, 85, and 90, respectively. Sylvester Stallone becomes progressively more ripped, and he looks much more like a fitness model than a boxer. So it's no coincidence that you've got these two hyper-competitive men rising to the top of Hollywood and they're competing with each other on this massive stage that influences billions of people. And it's, yeah, it's just no coincidence that that started to change the way people look at what the ideal male body looks like. I think it's important to say, like, it, obviously, it didn't change everything immediately. Nothing like that changes immediately. We're still talking about the 80s. So, like, globalization wasn't really fully underway yet. Obviously, there was no internet, let alone social media. Um, so, that information was still probably spreading very slowly, but it was spreading nonetheless. But that, that's still why you can find contrary examples before you, anyone throws them at me. <laughs> so, you would have had like Bruce Willis in Die Hard. That was 1988. So again, very much average guy mode. 
I feel like Mel Gibson's entire career at that point was of something similar. You know, they were just tough before, guys. Before the racism. Yeah, before, the it, before, before it went a bit weird. Um, yeah. But they were just tough guys. You know, they knew how to fight. You know, that was it. They weren't, they weren't beating people with brute force. It yeah. was just they were a bit cunning, you know, a bit mm. streetwise. They had more in common with the, like, 60s and 70s hard men than, say, Schwarzenegger yeah. and Stallone. Now, that was interesting because... I think you're right, actually. I think it did change with Schwarzenegger and Stallone. It, it did sort of move more towards this ripped, very muscular body. Um, and then I think from those people came the rise of these action films, which didn't really, you know, have too much. It was they weren't going to win Oscars, but they were obviously very mm. um, entertaining and action based. And you saw more people who had muscles, like John Claude Van Damme, for example, mm, yeah, a star in these films what well, it's interesting you, you you do talk about these contra- contrary examples during this time period because another interesting case study is the wwf or so it's known as the wwe now mm. um and actually in the late 80s and early 90s you, you didn't really even though you had they're very strong in their own right you didn't have these wrestlers who were incredibly ripped you only have to look at the examples uh, like uh, Hulk Hogan or you know Jake the Snake Robert, uh, Bret Hart, for example, there wasn't really like a big, you know, you didn't really have any noticeable six packs or anything like that. Not like mm. probably the wrestlers of today. And there, I mean, maybe the Ultimate Warrior was one example. Yeah. But I mean, I think he was on. I think he had a bit of help <laughs> from other <laughs> substances in order to get that that period that appearance. But if you look um, a bit further forward to late nineties, early two thousands. The, the big wrestlers were people like uh, The Rock and Stone Cold Steve Austin. I mean, they never really had, I mean, The Rock's, I mean, The Rock is, has, has evolved. And I mean, he's in his, what, probably 50s now, isn't he? And he's, yeah, probably, yeah. More, he's more muscular and more toned in his 50s when he was in his 20s when yeah. he was wrestling, which is, which perhaps showed that maybe at that time it wasn't so much of a, he didn't really need to have that, that toned body like he has now, but maybe it feels like he needs to in order to, get these parts and be in these action films yeah well the 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 biggest reason is those wrestlers and i guess you could say the same for like strong strong men as they're known they are they are built for strength like they are not built in theory anyway to look good they're built to be able to you know lift other men off the ground and I mean, yeah. you know, I'm not pretending it's real, obviously. <laughs> but, yeah. you know, to punch other men and kick other men and to yeah. beat other men up. And mm. the best way to do that is not to look like, you know, these chiseled, barely body fat men. It's to actually have a, a lot of bulk behind you. So let's look at male body image today. As we've already touched on, so we, me and you, mm. we're sort of, I don't want to speak on your behalf, but I feel I feel quite confident in this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we are sort of now out the other side of worrying too much about body image. We touched on it briefly in the introduction. A bit more at ease, let's say. Personally, like I, I still want to maintain, like you know, a relatively trim look. Um, and I, I genuinely do like doing resistance training. I, I just it, it's just something I like doing, but it it doesn't extend massively beyond that you know I don't want to be the strongest man in the room or anything like that if anything now like I've been work I've had work from home jobs since 2017 so for me it's just more you know the battle against the a massively sedentary lifestyle you know yeah um, I, I've had to exercise more if anything because you know, I'm not walking to work. I'm not commuting. I'm not walking to a train station or anything like that. So, I mean, it's the same. With, I mean, the same with me, really. Uh, I know. I mean, now I am going to the office more, and that involves a bike ride, which is great for me to actually have that, not just from a physical perspective, but to provide that mental space between mm. work and home. But yeah, when I was working from home all the time, it was you had to push yourself even more, really, to just get out move hmm. around even just like going for like a walk at lunchtime i remember just doing that just to get out the house and you know you had to be very proactive in what you were doing whereas probably before covid you just incorporated physical exercise into your commute probably you know yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. And now that you're right, we are, now we have a far more sedentary lifestyle. And as a result, people probably need to try harder to snap out of that, really. Even though we are where we are in years, um, I, I have had a little bit of insight into the world of younger men now. When I, when I came back home after my time abroad, I, I joined a gym in my local leisure center. It was like, this was like a big new leisure center, not like, you know, like a little pokey, uh, yeah. you know, outdated place. Yeah. So it was, it was very popular, it attracted people from, you know, all, all over the town and beyond. As you know, I'm a friendly guy. And yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, just got, I just got to know a few of the, the younger guys there. So at the time, they would have been like 17, 18, um, so the same age I was when I started. But they, uh, it became clear really quickly, like these guys were much, much more clued up than I was. They were doing their split sessions, meticulously planned exercises. They were tracking weight progression, both the weights they lifted and their weight. They were just into it big time already at that age. And so on, on a very basic level, I think that's good. Um, yeah. there are, there are so many <laughs> idiotic things boys at that age can do with their time. Uh, so I think putting hours in at the gym, improving your health, both, you know, mental, physical, improving your self-esteem at that age, in theory, that's, that's brilliant. That's good. But I could also see the sort of flip side to that. There was already this obsessive quality because when you're that age, you are impressionable and you can become very obsessive about things. So it, in some cases, it, it can be music or film, foot, your football club. Mm. But for these guys, it was the gym and their body image. So they had like, they had all the gear, like wrist straps, belts, knee, knee supports, chalk for their hands. Yeah, they had everything. It was like they'd seen the, a photo of a bodybuilder in a gym and like done the checklist. I need these things. And on top of that, they already had like, you know, the, the no days off mentality. Um, they counted calories, they monitored macros. They were taking all the supplements as well. So it was different types of protein supplements for different times of day. They were doing BCAAs, branched chain amino acids and pre-workouts again, which, yeah, the jury's out on that one definitely. But again, we'll sort of touch back on that in a, in a bit. I think it's important to say these, these things that I've said about them are not inherently wrong or anything, but they, re they require like a, a degree of education. Anything that involves your body, I believe, especially when it's still growing, you need to, to be clued up. You need to be careful about what you're putting into it and how hard you're pushing it. The reality is, and this is not just for young kids, but for all men and, and women, obviously, you're not training at an at an elite level you know mm. you're, you're going to the gym you don't need you know a a pre-workout that's marketed as a weapon yeah. <laughs> you, you know you don't need these energy gels that you get in pouches because you saw someone in the London marathon taking them when they were at mile 18 <laughs> you know yeah um so 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 the, these lads you were talking to I mean I guess just a couple of things that jump out at me firstly what you said they're 17 and 18 is is it healthy from a sort of body development perspective to be putting all this time into the gym at that age when your body is still developing because I remember even you know myself I don't think my body really stopped fully developing until probably at least last week <laughs> last, last week, yeah probably until at least like 21 right I mean but maybe 18 is like a good time to go to the gym but I mean is it is it is it healthy to have all this put all this time to going into the gym at that age when your body's still well i mean evolving? i'll do i'll do the the appropriate thing that anyone should do when they don't know the answer i don't know yeah, okay. <laughs> i'm not going to just pretend that i know the answer to everything yeah i i think that's another case of maybe the jury's out I, yeah I, I do think it's a case of I think it's just what your intentions are. So like, like I said about the elite level. So like if you have genuine aims of like going to the Olympics or, you know, playing football or rugby for England or some or any just elite level, then mm. probably you do need to do that because you do need to start young 
and you have to have this unwavering commitment mm. and that's why so few people ever do those things in 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 relative terms because it's hard and maybe because it's slightly dangerous i don't know but the re- the reality is that like, if you are an average young man you you don't need i guess this is just my opinion i then you don't need things like pre workouts and energy gels and you don't need to pretend that you need all this stuff to get you through a rigorous workout you know if you you will probably have a full time job or you'll be studying at college or university or something like that you know by default you will probably go to the gym four to five times a week you know i know this goes against all the sort of you can do anything and nothing is impossible content that is just everywhere now but in those circumstances there is a very clear ceiling to what you can achieve without taking like really drastic dis- destructive steps and i feel like saying that would be interpreted as being negative you know i'm trying to stop people from achieving their dreams but i i just for me is that's just the r- realistic outlook on things if you want to get anywhere close to being ripped or shredded or whatever you want to call it it is about sacrifice if you are working full time if you are studying you will have to sacrifice pretty much all of your free time that that's what would make the difference between someone who wants to go and have that body and someone who's not that bothered about it ultimately so if you do want to do that you will wake up you will work or study you will go to the gym you will eat rest and sleep that will pretty much be your life and in all the pockets in between you'll be thinking about your nutrition anyway you'll be thinking about you know should i have that snack should I, you know what what should i have can i have that drink it will consume you you know and i think mm. if you are 18 19 whatever i think that kind of consumption is not ideal i'm not going to say not healthy maybe it is not healthy but i i just think if you're impressionable you're growing in your mind and your body you need to be a for me it's good to be a bit less obsessed to that extent because you will become you know you will become a worse friend and you won't be able to handle romantic relationships either like well all relationships of any sort or any relationships i guess um it comes down to balance doesn't it really i mean i know balance is actually a common theme across all our podcasts creating this balance for yourself where you do stuff you enjoy like going to the gym you want to do things that in your opinion will make you a better person a better man but doing it in a way that's not going to sacrifice relationships with others or sacrifice your your life in such a way that it becomes a negative thing because mm-hmm. as we mentioned at the beginning the gym is a positive thing and the fact that i think so many younger people are going to the gym now i think is largely a positive thing but obviously it's, it's when things get a bit too obsessive i guess it can turn a bit unhealthy can't it mm. did, did did you ever did, did you ever feel like you got too obsessive with the gym it's mostly been balanced there i have definitely pushed myself too far on mm. on occasions definitely but it's, it's been different periods of life so like when i was younger like i, I had no no um intention of becoming you know ripped so i i would go to the gym and go out plenty i would go drinking and eat the bad foods and all of that but because you're young and going to the gym you you burn a lot of that off you know it doesn't yeah. have it doesn't have a massive impact on you i funnily enough the, the time it the times it's only probably become a bit more obsessive is when i stopped drinking and yeah like you pick up injuries and stuff like that and yeah, that's it, i always think the injury is when it shows how much you care mm. for better or worse if you get an injury and you just think oh i just need to keep going i just need to work through it the injury will get better but that's quite a masculine thing as well isn't um, it it's yeah. not it's not i'm, I'm going to rest up yeah. this is an injury you just think and it's exactly ah, injuries are for wusses or whatever yeah. and it's know. exactly the same with um mental health issues isn't it it's this yeah. it's the, the exact same concept of um, i'm feeling bad i just need to get through it so yeah, if you have an injury that 
doesn't, you know, completely sideline you. It's very common to just keep going. And I've, I've done that a hundred percent and I shouldn't have <laughs> basically. Yeah. Uh, but now I would say I'm definitely not in that phase. It's much more of a listen to your body. You're not going to become Thor. <laughs> all of these things and I, I think it's also a good point to good time to point out by far the most common male body type in your average gym for want of a better word is stocky mm -hmm. it is muscular with some fat that is the most common kind of body you will see and it and it's it, that is because it is the healthiest and most balanced and those people are still having a very, you would hope, a very fulfilled life outside of the gym. They don't then go home and, you know, eat rice cakes and rice it, and broccoli for, it, for and chicken breast unseasoned. Yeah, fish, unseasoned <laughs> for, fish. For every meal. Again, if you're competing, if you want to become a champion bodybuilder, then that's what you need to do but if you're just going to the gym four to five times a week it's i just don't think that's necessary when you talk about body types i just want to add a little note to that i don't like to simplify body types just like you don't simplify people there are all sorts of body types um and like genetics comes into it metabolism comes into it but yeah i just think when you take that realistic outlook on things if you are a, a an average man let's say and you do have those common responsibilities if you don't, if you cannot get to that level of like some kind of superhero, it's not a failing. You, you, you don't, it's not that you don't want it enough. Yeah. I think as well, what people sometimes forget is that if they want to look like an action star, a lot of, a lot of work and support goes into making people look like that. For mm. example, personal trainers, where they're basically telling you what to eat, what to lift, and obviously a lot of money goes into as well. And that's very, obviously that's almost impossible to replicate. Well, let's go into it then. Let's like, yeah. we thought we touched on Marvel as like a, maybe a turning point for the hairless <laughs> yeah. muscle bag look. So that, we'll, we'll look into it. So I, I, I personally believe, and like many other people that the superhero films, not just Marvel, obviously, but there are the, generally the superhero films has something to answer for in, in establishing this unrealistic male body image that is going around at the moment yeah like in in a relatively short period of time they have made like literal superhero bodies a, another aspirational commodity is mm. is something that people want just as much to show off than anything else so i did one of the quickest ways to illustrate this is to look at hugh jackman in the first x-men film this was to the year 2000 like google it whatever you want to do I, I won't go into too much detail now i've seen that there's some caveats to this like there were casting problems he came to the project late and obviously didn't get in a full regime of training i think they even saved his shirtless scene to the very end like to give him a little bit more time but if you look at those images they are so stark to the standards of what we see today in in the later superhero films i mean like to like putting it simply like he looks like if we're bearing in mind he's wolverine yeah. he looks like a normal athletic man who trains five days a week and watches what he eats yeah. like there's there's hardly any definition is there's a hundred percent no six pack he's got hair on his body god and yeah. and yet millions of men would still love to look like that and mm. they still couldn't and yet it now by today's standards it looks weird so but, it shows you where that disparity is but it's interesting you mentioned Hugh Jackman because he actually now when he does the Wolverine well not now whenever whenever the last Wolverine film was he is a lot more muscular isn't he and a lot more toned mm. right than he was back in 2000, presumably yeah. because there's now a greater demand for that sort of look. And people say as well, well, you're in his, is he in his 50s probably yeah, now? Hugh Jackman, definitely. Yeah. Is, yeah. You're in your 50s and you look like that. That's unbelievable. Mm. And that's a, that's a good story, isn't it? To say that, you know, someone of that age can still look like that. Um, and I guess it's probably, like you said, an aspirational commodity 
younger men look at her and think, well, if he's 50 looking like mm. that, then surely I should be looking like that. You know, in a way, it makes you feel bad, doesn't it? Because you think, mm. gosh, he's that old, yet he looks like that. And look at the state of me. I, I, I remember vi- vividly I w- when I went to see the first Avengers movie, it would be 10 years ago now. I remember coming out of the cinema and thinking like, I, I want to go to the gym now. <laughs> 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 like, I, I, know, I know a lot of that's to do with like the music and like it, it leaves you on that, you know, it, it pumps you up and it gets you fully involved in, in what's happening. But yeah, I, I just, yeah, I really remember that. Like, I want to go to the gym. I, I, I'm going to, you know, <laughs> that, that's going to be me. You know, in much the same way, like, like all the toxic female beauty standards, you know, they, they pushed all manner of diets and fads. And those caused, you know, generations of like insecurities and eating disorders. Now, I, you know, many men are now chasing a, an equally unrealistic standard and they can't get it. I just think everyone all of us men and women for for buying into these things we, we're all the worse for it how would you describe a strong body probably that sort of arnold schwarzenegger type look maybe or you know the marvel the marvel action hero look that mm-hmm. to me would be a strong body it's, you know, a noticeable six pack. It is this very strong arm muscles. It is, but I guess maybe it's also an athletic physique as well. Mm-hmm. So, so maybe not Schwarzenegger because the bodybuilding one always looks a bit too much. So probably more like, like we s- said earlier, the Marvel action hero. That's to me now what I'd see as a strong body. Captain America. Captain America, yeah, four. <laughs> something like that. It's strong, toned, but also athletic as well at the same time. Yeah, I mean, we won't go too far in this other direction, but it becomes, you get into sort of, a, there's a fine line between pure strength and like practicality. If you think of like those bodybuilders, they look very strong and they are, mm-hmm. but, you know, I can't imagine them having to run for a bus or something. <laughs> you know <laughs> it'd be a bit more of a waddle wouldn't it yeah because your legs are so big you know you can't I and mean, that's a problem and also that kind of thing leads to like even being able to find clothes but yeah what I would say so as like a, a very broad concept to start with mm. the idea of strength is essentially the the pinnacle of the traditional masculinity mm. both physically and mentally so the mental side you know, keeping it together, not showing emotions, not crying. And then the physical side is, you know, just being able to lift the heaviest weight over your head or beating up other men in a fight. So, <laughs> so in that's a way, why... it gives you a bit more confidence as well. I see people who are oh, very yeah, strong yeah. who are like weirdly confident because of mm. how strong they are. And I guess yeah. that's probably how it helps them it helps them you know in the same way that being rich would give you that level of confidence being mm. physically physically strong and muscular gives you that well that's why levels of that's why well. for like for a lot of men like the, the combination of being rich muscular and physically strong is like that's perfection because yeah. it 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 equates to total domination basically <laughs> both of both you know you can dominate weaker men and women i mean they they wouldn't that kind of man probably wouldn't take into account uh, any other genders <laughs> but um yeah it, it, it's it is the case of literally i can buy you or, or and or i can beat you up if you've got all of it you have completed masculinity <laughs> basically yeah, so at, at the end of the last section, um, we said uh, one of the most pervasive ideas of what a strong man looks like is that very muscular and with hardly any body fat. I mean, you said it even in the start of this section. Um, so, yeah, the massive arms, chest and the six pack, that kind of uh, image. But, but there's two things that stand out with, with that image. Mm. One, like you say, is incredibly difficult to achieve. Mm. And interestingly it's not necessarily the the best representation of strength so we'll start with the the first one 
So on a, on a scientific level, it's all but impossible to build muscle and lose fat at the same time. Now I say all but impossible because there, there's some, you know, master personal trainers who say it is possible, <laughs> but that alone shows the kind of level you would be at to be doing that. Yeah. One, you would need to be able to afford to pay a master personal trainer and you would have to be having, sorry, putting in so much time that it's, that's a different world. Mm. So yeah, generally speaking, another lesson here, what would this be? Biology? I don't know. PE? <laughs> a bit of generally, both. Yeah. Generally speaking, so to build muscle, you need to eat considerably more food. To lose fat, you have to be in a calorie deficit. So yeah, I, I, we won't go into too much technical stuff here, but this is, that's also where um, the terms bulking and cutting come in. Mm. So again, I'm being incredibly simplified here. So during the bulking phase, you eat more food and you lift increasingly heavier weights and that will grow your muscles. Then you switch to cutting where you slowly reduce your calories and you're not so worried about, you know, constantly lifting heavier weights. It's more about maintain, maintenance, you know, keeping the weights at a good level. So, yeah, in theory, if you execute that well, the fat strips away. You barely lose any muscle, but you will lose a little bit. But you will leave behind a very ripped body type. But again, that's associated with, you know, professional bodybuilding, that, those cycles. Yeah. It, it, it's done for a reason. Like there is an end goal. You bulk and then cut and you time it because you want to be at your most lean and, and defined in time for a competition you're not doing it because you know you're going to the gym in winter and then summer you know it, it's it's that has that's another thing that's sort of seeped in now and yeah it's just this idea of bringing like professional standards to something that is very amateur again normal person working full time working five days a week imagine the sacrifices you're making there like you would you would have to either res drastically restrict or eliminate alcohol yeah. all the foods that you like you'll probably have to eliminate those as well yeah. there will be no variety to your food or, or not as much as you would normally have yeah. you would probably lose all social activity because you're also very tired and you need to sleep a lot it just you know time with your loved ones you know yeah. you, you might miss things like birthdays anniversaries even Christmas and Easter stuff like that becomes an obstacle and if you don't have if there is not this clearly defined thing at the end of it it's just for some selfish reason because you mm. want to be mm. ripped <laughs> and strong yeah. and, I guess and, you, it and you want people to fear you yeah and I guess it comes down to the sacrifices you're willing to make there may be people out there that are willing to make the sacrifice in order to attain a certain body type mm. however people may just look at this and think you know what this is just a lot of work similar to you and I really Rob they just mm. think you know I want to keep myself fit I want to do you know weights I want to uh, keep myself physically active but I'm not going to go down this rabbit hole where I'm sacrificing things I like doing and you know time spent with friends and family in order to get to this end goal because it's just not yeah. worth it well the, the important thing is to say there is that it's because if you if you are just a again I'm using that word a lot normal man is that there is no end goal the, the, yeah. if you have a competition it's so clearly defined i need to get to this point by this time and then after that you re revert back to normal if yeah. there is no e clear end goal it, it becomes endless you know yeah and that's unhealthy again mentally and physically let's go back to some of the points we didn't cover before about like the superhero things in that case then mm. yeah like when, when you watch a, a superhero film those massive bodies and highly defined bodies they are not what that person looks like all the time they are passing they are impermanent and months of hard work and planning goes into just the shirtless scenes alone. Um, so I, I found a, an article. So 
it's a bit of a strange one. It's 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 it, <laughs> it's an article quoting another article. So okay, is this um, like an Inception article? Yeah, we're getting into Inception levels here. So this was on Slate.com. I the article was shredding the superhero body myth. And they quoted a man called Logan Hill's article called Building a Better Action Hero. Okay. So this is the quote. Since 5% body fat is nobody's natural condition, fitness plans are geared to peak on the days of the sex scenes or shirtless moments. To prep for these days, trainers will dehydrate a client like a boxing manager sweats a fighter down to weight. They often switch him to a low or no sodium diet three or four days in advance, fade out the carbohydrates, brew up diuretics like herbal teas, and then push cardio to sweat out water, all to accent accentuate muscle definition for the key scenes. And then on, on top of that, you would add stuff like getting a last minute pump. I think he quotes Brad Pitt in Snatch. Again, another um, famous body from film. Just dropping down, doing like push-ups right before the scene starts. You, you were already dehydrated and very hungry. And then you, you drop down and do these press ups. It gives you that rush and it, it makes you very vascular. It is just so fleeting. You know, when you realize that, it's actually quite liberating. <laughs> but I, I think, in a way, that people need to know the background behind these things. Hmm. Shouldn't it be on Hollywood or actors to say, look, this is what I do to look like this? Do not dry yourself out. You will collapse. I, I, do, I did this, but I did this for a very specific moment, not to look like this all the time. Because surely if people knew that, that it was pretty much an unrealistic thing they were looking to attain, then surely they might think twice before mm. trying to get to that level, right? Yeah, I mean, they sh I, I would, you would love it if it was much more known. Yeah. I mean, you can argue this is similar to like, the the diets and the the teas and stuff which are pushed mm. towards women that you probably said there's too much money involved along the line one thing i found in in research in this I, I really probably i want to get the pronunciation right but i probably will get it wrong i yeah. apologize if i do uh, kumail nanjiani so he he did that he had quite an especially famous transformation didn't he for the eternals because yeah. he was always seen as he's a comedian obviously and had a, a, just a very normal body type and then one day he just posts this picture <laughs> where he is absolutely like we say body of a god and it, and everyone everyone was just astounded so it was it was it, it was famous because he was like the first south asian superhero yeah. But it was because it was him, the type of man he was before, and also that he was in his 40s. He actually was very realistic about it. So this is what he said for, uh, next to that picture. Uh, I found out a year ago I was going to be in Marvel's Eternals and decided I wanted to transform how I looked. I would not have been able to do this if I didn't have a full year with the best trainers and nutritionists paid for by the biggest studio in the world. I'm glad I looked like this, but I also understand why I never did before. It would have been impossible without these resources and time. Yeah, I mean, that you touched on it briefly in section one, but it's, we can just reiterate the point. These men, the superhero men, can work out twice a day and to insane standards because it's their living. That is their job. They're not going to, they're not working somewhere else eight hours a day and then fitting in afterwards. Yeah. You know, movie studios are paying them millions of dollars and they're paying multiple support staff very, very handsomely as well. All you have to do is show up and put in the work. And that's, that's hard. I'm not trying to diminish that. They work incredibly hard. But when you cut out all of the surrounding stuff around it, it does become easier so it goes back to what i said earlier about um how if you have the time and resources to be able to commit to these sorts of workout routines and these dietary plans and you can get to that level probably you myself or yourself could get to that level as well if we were just basically told 
you're not working for yeah. a couple of months. This is what you're going to eat. You're going to have this yeah, personal trainer could. come to your house every, you know, twice a day. You're going to do this workout. I mean, it'd be hard work and probably quite depressing, but we could get there. And I'm sure anyone could get there as well. You know, you can do as much gym work as you like, but it, it might not, it won't get you to that level of these Hollywood stars. An underrated side of it is food. And then obviously food expenses. Yeah. Like meat and fish are not cheap at the best of times. And obviously there's a scale based on the quality. But if you're eating six meals a day, you know, your, you know, your, your food bill is going to be astronomical. And again, if you're young, you're going to feel that more because, you know, younger people are just generally not as well off. So yeah, I, I saw... Um, Chris Hemsworth's stunt double. So this would be for the, the the Thor films, you would imagine. Yeah, he he said that he if he wanted to get anywhere near the size of Chris Hemsworth, he would have to eat thirty five times a day. You even get to the point then where you're like, that makes food miserable as well. If you're eating it all the time, like multiple more than six times a day, ten times a day, you're gonna just start to have a very unhealthy relationship with food even it's just yeah. and it's not even the traditional unhealthy foods like chocolate and fatty foods for example mm. it's carbohydrates as well like you know pastas mm. that bread is a big one isn't good it? yeah bread as well bread is a big one they give you it gives you energy that it, it, it takes also it tastes really good as well <laughs> they're just going to be cut out and you're going to have this very mundane meals consisting of basically like you said chicken and broccoli or fish and spinach or something like that you, if you're if you're exercising consistently you are becoming healthier and stronger in in every respect so you are getting results they're just not as drastic as um what you've been led to believe you can achieve in the time say over six months or a year it's that kind of sense of failure or even the sense of rushing because you feel like it's so achievable that will lead to more drastic action. Mm. That's where you start to take more supplements and because you're taking more and if you're younger, maybe you can't afford trusted ones. You might be putting in sort of dodgy stuff into your body, more pills, pre-workouts, and then ultimately it might even lead to um, steroids. People Is it more, more widespread than people probably realize? I would imagine so. Again, I, I'm not perfectly placed to answer that, but mm. just based on what I've seen and heard, I, it's more than I thought it was for sure. I always think of steroids as being purely like, you know, elite sportsmen, mm. that kind of thing. But it's clearly not. It's clearly people who want to look good, you know, in swimming trunks. <laughs> You know, people going to Marbella or something, you know, yeah. that, that they will do that 100%. Not all of them, obviously, but certainly a lot of them. Was on the topic of steroids, so this is our, one of our first ever listener <laughs> contributions. One of our listeners, uh, Violet Harris, pointed us in the direction of a trend called Natty or Not. Mm. I, I hadn't heard of this, so I'm obviously... It's first, obviously out of first I'm, news for me as well. I'm, I'm not in the... <laughs> not in the age range but I, yeah, I did some rooting around so I went on the subreddit the subreddit was called natty or juice so obviously juice means steroids so essentially on there people post photos of other bodybuilders who claim to be natural yeah people who claim to be natural and in the group discusses if they think they're taking steroids or not um, yeah. and I also there's plenty of YouTube videos on a similar theme I, I saw some I mean is, well. isn't this a form of like public shaming in a way for yeah those who are taking that's steroids. why I was that was my initial I always get like that my gut reaction was like oh this feels a bit like a sort of you know public square you know public shaming for throwing, tom <laughs> throwing tomatoes but yeah. the more you the more I thought about it I was like yeah calling people out who say they're not taking steroids but are for me I, I think that is a right thing to do because they are perpetuating unrealistic and harmful standards the, the sort of borderline thing comes when you have to know for sure that that person is taking steroids you know, you, you can't just if you don't like someone and and they're, they're you know really muscular and hardly any body fat you can't just say you're taking steroids 
and you've got no proof mm. i guess it's difficult to find proof but yeah that that's the side of it where it'd get a bit a bit um dodgy for me but it, it's very similar to i've always i've already mentioned them on instagram you get celebrities mm. promoting fat loss teas that kind of thing and those things are essentially laxatives that's how you lose the weight you just shit out basically <laughs> they don't they don't, the, they don't use that and they don't talk about that in no, do they but it's so yeah like the whole natty or not thing it does get quite deep i you know I, I didn't research it massively but i could see from what i did it was you know it gets a bit deep quite speculative because again it's it's based on what you think is is true and obviously many people will have a very informed opinion they will know the signs to look for and it's stuff like uh, one of them I remember was like very peaked shoulders but yeah you can then end up looking at like genetic capacity multi-year cycles yeah, so for me the whole sort of natty or not thing just points like and this is across the board you shouldn't find inspiration lightly that's not just for men with strength and body image. That's, that's, I think that should be true for everybody. You know, don't get fooled by an image of fabrication or a lie, you know, dig around a bit. You know, that's not to say like that your idols and inspirations are going to be spotless because no one is, mm. but they shouldn't be milking you dry either. <laughs> and mm. they, they, should, they also shouldn't be harming your health. Yeah, so it feels like a long time ago now, but there was one other point <laughs> where we talked about that image, which was it's not the best representation of strength. If you look at like genuine strongman competitions, like nobody looks like those superhero bodies, you know, the pinched in waist, the six pack, all of those things. They, they, the strong men are like pure beasts. Like they have much more in common with, you know, the original Rocky that we talked about and the WWF wrestlers, like they are built for strength and it's the idea if you're building for strength you are not building for aesthetics that's probably why you don't see that kind of body in those kind of films because just the way we've all been conditioned the marvel superhero body looks much more attractive on screen like to men and women you know they're heroes they're gods they're aliens you know of course they're strong and you could argue of course it's unrealistic but actually the reality is like when you do strip your body fat down to say five percent or less you will actually look surprisingly small um you'll be very defined and maybe like there's camera angles at work here but it, it almost looks a bit frail and like much weaker than you would imagine so it's just it's it's very it's very ironic that you know these people are like symbols of strength and inspiration on screen but in that in the moment that they inspire the most they're actually quite weak well these people could collapse any minute couldn't they yeah because they're, they're drying themselves out <laughs> even though they have this one of have this appearance of strength they could be feeling incredibly weak knackered and because what they're doing isn't entirely healthy or recommended it's just so clear to see that like you know being strong is is far more than you know having muscles and low body fat simply admitting that the ideal buff body isn't attainable for you given your circumstances is in its own way a show of strength and then from that position, you can work towards building a body that you are comfortable with. <clears throat> I don't know if I've come across a sort of a bit negative on some of these things. It's certainly not my intention. As, as we said before, I, I'm a regular gym goer. I, I'm interested in, in nutrition and um, how the body works and all these things. So I, for the conclusion, I, I want to focus on the positive aspects of exercise and going to the gym. Again, like you touched on, I'll just reiterate, exercise in general, not just going to the gym, being active is great for mental health. That could be walking, jogging, and resistance training, all of them. When you see those results, again, you develop that habit and you want to go more. And that's where you get the consistency and that's where you get even more results for you know, the kind of thing that you wanted to see when you started. In a wider sense, 
the gym is is a great place to meet like-minded people like you can sometimes build a, a small community like i said I, when i started going to that gym with the younger guys and we, there's a big age difference be, between us but we just started talking and there was old guys older than me joining in and you know you, you get to know people you you know their names you know a bit about them and it's nice you know you go to the gym you exercise and you see these people so that's an, another really really good good side of um exercise and, and gym going just don't wrap your idea of who you are as a man into that like i said at the start i think that the gym and just exercise in general is a force for good the problems happen when maybe people take it a bit too seriously without the proper guidance and advice and also when they're trying to reach these goals which are essentially unattainable overall i think is a fantastic thing and i think that people you know i'd recommend doing that more than perhaps doing nothing i think like the the going too far side of it is again like i mean it's very obvious wrapped up in that tra traditional masculinity is it comes in competitiveness and just that sort of willingness to put your goals above everybody else's especially those in your you know the people you have close relationships with and also just think just thinking that you're an expert on ev <laughs> on everything <laughs> and then an, another side of that in the in the sort of masculinity world and this makes me cringe sometimes it's like when people start talking about like ancestors hunters the code of masculinity is oh my god is um yeah it's just i don't know why you need to go to that place i just don't know why you mentally need to take it there. there there are so many ways to motivate yourself i just don't get it i mean even we'll go back to kumal nanjiani I mean, he said this about his his body transformation it's aggression it's anger a lot of the times we are taught to be useful by using physical strength or our brain in an aggressive competitive way not in an empathetic way not in an open collaborative way it's about defeating and that's what the male ideal has been dominating defeating crushing killing mm. destroying that's what being jacked is that's from male body image in cinematic superhero era unattainable and unrealistic on the nationalnews.com but it, yeah it's just that imagery like the animal aggression imagery like lions wolves survivor it's just you can see why other people don't want to go to certain gyms because like the some of the male energy in them is just such <laughs> basically it's so off-putting and I can I, see why it puts people off going to the gym particularly if you're a beginner and you have this idea that people dominate defeat crush and destroy the gym and you have people who just want to go there to essentially just be a, a better version of themselves really mm -hmm. at the end of the day they don't want to have this you know overwhelming masculine energy when they you know go there they just want to just want to lose a bit of weight really so i think moving away from that will be is really useful particularly with the gym and at the end at the end of the day it'd be good for the gyms so there'll be more people going there won't there if you are just working out if you're just going to the gym again like you say this is not to downplay it it's put, just putting that realism on it if you are going there to become stronger, leaner, fitter, great, you don't need to pretend you're at war to do that. You know, you just need to do it. Maybe, you know, put on your like, you know, that playlist that really gets you pumped, you know, I, do whatever you want. But you, I just don't I just don't get that next step of pretending, you know, I am in a wolf pack. <laughs> <laughs> when you remove that hyper hyper masculine imagery it, it it boils down to control 
So again, from the same national news article I just quoted before, they say, well, they described getting buff, that's the word they used, as a way of controlling the immediate environment in the absence of external control. And I think that sums up really well. You, you're, you're living a life, and if you're a normal person, there is so much that you cannot control. And that, can, that doesn't feel good. So having things that help you have a stronger sense of control of your life, that give you more direction, and benefits you mentally and physically, it's a great thing. It is a really, really great thing. You're, you will be a better uh, man, husband, boyfriend, um, you know, all of them, father, brother, whatever, you know, you will be just a better person. And you, you, don't, you just don't need to bring all that aggression into it. Because for me, going to the gym actually gets the aggression out you know it shouldn't build more aggression it should be your release you know work out because it improves your health and self-esteem not because you think you're a marine when you finish work jack where can people find you on social media sir i'm on twitter at jack mel yep and i'm on twitter and instagram at robert stimson and in the next episode we will be looking at effeminacy